Hello. Good evening to all who have joined online for the SLMA webinar series organized by the Sri Lanka Medical Association. We are trying to address an important topic in this webinar series today. It's not long ago. I mean, it is in this week that the, I mean, this, this week is declared as the Antimicrobial Resistance Week by the World Health Organization, as it is an important topic for all of us medical professionals. We have been using antimicrobials for decades and wherever if we have achieved a cure, more often it is for antibiotics or antimicrobials. So on a day that antimicrobials are no longer available, then it would be so much difficult. And I mean, that's going to affect our performance and it would be a disastrous situation for people as well as, I mean, humans in general, as well as for animals. So it is in that sense that we thought that we need to pay attention for this important topic. And particularly because this is the week for antimicrobial resistance. So to commemorate that week, we arrange this topic with the help of three eminent speakers. We have lined up three speakers, Dr. Kushlani Jayatilaka, consultant microbiologist from the Sri Jayavadhanapur General Hospital, Kote, and Professor Predashini Galapati, Professor of Pharmacology, Faculty of Medicine, University of Colombo, and Dr. Roshan Priyanta, Veterinary Research Officer, Bacteriology uh, Division, Veterinary Research Institute. So the, uh, uh, um, to commence the uh, uh, presentations and the webinar, uh, initially, uh, let me thank all three speakers for consenting, for agreeing to join this panel, as well as decide, for deciding to spend on this topic, on, I mean, deciding to spend their valuable time on this topic. So let me now invite uh, uh, Dr. Kushlani Jayatilaka, consultant microbiologist from Sri Jayawadhanapur Hospital, Kote, to address her topic, that's post-antibiotics era, are we heading towards? Kushlani, over to you. Thank you very much, Madam. Uh, and thank you for inviting me to deliver this topic uh, lecture today. I will uh, share my slides. So, yes. Post-antibiotic era, are we heading towards? Most of the interventions in modern medicine would not be possible without effective antimicrobials, the inventions like a, the transplant surgery or chemotherapy will not be possible without antimicrobials. What are the problems with antimicrobial therapy? As for any other medicines, we know that it can have adverse effects, even ending up in death like uh, pseudomembranous colitis, but also there can be allergic reactions like anaphylaxis or any other serious allergic reactions as for any other medicine. But those are affecting only the patient who is taking the antimicrobial or the antibiotic. The problem that we are talking today mainly is the antibiotic resistance, which is not only affecting the person who is taking the antimicrobial, but also it spreads to others in the community. This is the worrying problem. So what is antibiotic resistance? As we know, it is when organisms are not inhibited or killed by an antibacterial agent at concentrations of the drug achievable in the body after normal dosage. So there are two types of resistance. Intrinsic resistance is when the organism was never susceptible to a particular antibiotic. The, for example, uh, for pseudomonas, penicillin was never effective. So we can't do much about it. But the problem is this acquired resistance, where it has now uh, acquired resistance is said to occur when a particular microorganism obtains the ability to become resistant to a particular antimicrobial agent to which it was previously susceptible. So this is what we are worried about. So how can they do that? Now, it's a single cell like this with a chromosome in the middle, and there can be extra chromosomal plasmids uh, here like this, extra chromos uh, chromosomal DNA. 
and which can also, there are several mechanisms or many mechanisms that can help to develop antibiotic resistance like enzymes can be developed which can destroy these antibiotics or they can change the target molecule so that the antibiotic cannot bind to the cell or they can modify their cell walls so that antibiotic cannot enter the cell to act or they can pump out the antibiotics even if they come in with flux, flux pumps. So how can, if you go to the genetic level, what will happen? How does it happen? Now look at the bacterium, how they multiply. So they, they, we know that they multiply very fast and they form a population like this. When they multiply, there's always the chance they always get mutations in their DNA. And here you can see that two bacteria have developed uh, mutation, a little change in their genetic material. These two are different to others. If you, if you imagine that this uh, mutation help, uh, codes for a resistant mechanism, such as a beta-lactamase enzyme, then these two will have some resistance which others don't have to a particular antibiotic. Now, if you don't uh, expose this bacterial population to antibiotic, these people, these bacteria, sorry, will have a competition among themselves and there won't be a big issue with these two bacteria here. But if you expose this population to the antibiotic which these two are resistant to, the sensitive bacteria will die and the two that are resistant will remain. Now, without any intervention, in any, in any competition, now these two can multiply to form a antibiotic resistant population of bacteria. So this is what happens in our gut flora, where we have millions of normal good uh, flora, which is important for us, will become resistant if we take antibiotic for any indication, because it will go all over the body and it will change our normal flora to a resistant and bacterial flora. Not only that, there are, and this resistance uh, can be with the genes which are on plasmids, then they can be transmitted from one bacterium to the other. We can different mechanism by conjugation through uh, or through phages like uh, transduction or transformation. When they die, the bacteria can take it up by uh, the plasmids can be taken up by another bacterium like this. The genetic material can be transferred from one bacterium to the other. So this is another big problem. And what happens in the community when you give antibiotics to a person? their gut flora become resistance. Here, you can see that they have shown the gut flora so that uh, when they come to a hospital, again, you may have more antibiotics given here and more bacterial resistance and they can spread it through healthcare worker hands or equipment to other healthcare work, uh, other patients. And in the community, they can spread to other colleagues or household contacts. And also, if the antibiotics are given to animals, their excreta will again contaminate the environment and through the vegetations or even through the food chain, their meat products, they can come to the humans. So this is the cycle that we are seeing today. And in this report on review on antimicrobial resistance, they have predicted that by 2050, uh, 10 million people will die a year with uh, antimicrobial resistance it will be more than the deaths due to cancer. And the, in the same report, it says that the highest number of deaths will be in Asia, where we live. So now it's another report of a, a study which was done uh, where Dutch travelers who had gone to different countries and when they come back home, they have looked at their resistant, at the antibiotic resistance in their gut flora. And they have seen that people who travel to, sorry, the, those who traveled to the south, southern Asia had got the highest question of resistance. So this is not good for our tourism either. So this is the problem with the South Asian countries like India and Sri Lanka, where we have antibiotic misuse. Uh, we have a lot of antibiotic resistance. If you look at the data, that is very apparent here. If you look at the glass uh, global surveillance data that we have, actually we have uh, sent the data to the global antimicrobial resistance surveillance in 2020. And in blood cultures, these are all invasive isolates where we isolated them from blood cultures. We can see that acinetobacters had 55% resistance to carbapenems and 
uh, Klebsiella pneumonia, nearly 40% resistance to carbapenems like metapenem and imipenem, and 8.4% resistance in E. coli to carbapenems. And third generation cephalosporin resistance in Klebsiella and E. coli were more than 60%. And quinolone resistance was around 60%. And MRSA in Staph aureus was more than 50%. And streptococcus pneumonia had penicillin resistance for around 66.7% of them. So this is, uh, if you compare this with the United Kingdom, now see the green line is the UK data. Uh, MRSA rates less than 5% in blood cultures. And E. coli invasive isolates in third generation cephalosporin resistance is around 10% only. We had around more than 60%. Whereas Klebsiella pneumonia, Carbapenem resistance, less than 1%. Whereas we had, uh, in Klebsiella, we had more than uh, sort of uh, 40%, nearly 40% was resistant, you can, if you can remember. So this is the problem that we are seeing in our country. So again, uh, from UK Health Security Agency, Dr. Hopkins had uh, mentioned that antibiotic resistant infections could trigger a new hidden pandemic once COVID is over. What about the new antibiotics? Are we getting new antibiotics? Now here you can see the antibiotics, different groups were invented up to 1960s. And, uh, but after that, there's a big gap. The inventions of new antibiotics were very slow. And there are only few coming up now, but then still they are they're having limited, uh, very limited spectrum and very um, only few groups have come after that. And, but on the other hand, if you look at the bottom here, you can see the development of resistance to these groups of antibiotics are continuing. So the new antibiotics are very few and they have limited spectrum and they need to, I mean, they are only effective for a certain resistant mechanism and therefore diagnostic facilities need to be improved to use them. So this is uh, where the experts say, are we going, the post-antibiotic era. What can we do about it? One example here is in broiler, where in Denmark, when they banned the use of a particular antibiotic called Everfacin in broiler, uh, they, they saw that the resistance in the gut flora of broiler came down to zero. So this is what we, we uh, it will happen to us as well. If we stop using antimicrobials, our resistant flora can be uh, minimized or reduced but we need to use the antimicrobials. So how can we use them? One thing that we have seen is sometimes even doctors are not sure if the antimicrobials are needed when they are prescribing them. This is shown in this survey. So if you get, take an example, a 35 year old young man coming with fever for two days, clinically well, no other problem. Would you give antibiotics to this patient? No, what is the differential diagnosis? It's mostly viral. COVID-19 is a possibility now, dengue, influenza, and many other, mostly viral infections. And patient is clinically stable. So you don't need to give antibiotics. Then that is one way to reduce use. So you must not prescribe antibiotics for patients who are not septic and having probable viral infection, allergic, allergic conditions, or other limited self-limiting conditions. So even if it's a bacterial gastroenteritis like salmonellosis, even in healthy people, even they don't need antibiotics. So upper respiratory tract infections, most sinusitis, non-infected wounds, gastroenteritis and viral infections, viral fevers don't need antibiotics. Then if you're not sure whether it's a viral or a bacterial infection, you can always do investigations, blood investigations like full blood count or CRP, and the urine culture or blood culture, if possible, would be useful to be done before starting antimicrobials. So what if you start the antimicrobials or antibiotics, and then you get the reports and you decide that it is a viral infection? Then you can stop the antibiotics. You don't need to continue for so many days just because you started an antibiotic, because giving long courses of antibiotics are more prone to develop resistance. So this is another patient, a 65-year-old female who has low in pain and confusion, who is a diabetic and coming with uh, restlessness and high fever with uh, tachycardia, uh, high respiratory rate and low BP. 
So in this patient, what is the differential diagnosis? Probably this patient is in sepsis. So we have to start an antibiotic without delay. What antibiotics to give? That is, you can always refer guidelines. You must refer guidelines. There's a guideline published by the College of Microbiology along with the other colleges and the Ministry of Health. They have published it in their website. So you can download it and use it. This is for empiric and prophylactic use of antimicrobials. In 2016, we have published. How to use the antibiotics? It is important to give the correct dose. Why? Now, if you give a very small dose, you can see in this graph, if you plot the time versus concentration in the blood, it will be a curve like this. It will come to a peak and then it will come down with time. And if you look at the bacterial population here, now here there are two red ones like what I showed earlier. They have developed a little resistance. Now, if you give a very small dose, they will not reach the minimum inhibitory concentration of this population and they will not kill any of them. But if you give a moderate dose, they will kill the sensitive bacteria, but the resistant ones will remain and they will multiply and form a resistant population. But if you give large enough doses with the high C, C maximum, called the con maximum concentration, to kill all the mutations, uh, then that is called uh, above the mutant prevention concentration. That is what we want to achieve. And also we know with time, with uh, multiple doses, you can get uh, uh, increase in the concentration and it will come to a steady state like this. And it is very important to decide to get a, in some antibiotics, it is very important to get the peak. Uh, the high peak is important. Examples like aminoglycosides, uh, where the effectiveness will depend on the maximum concentration. And also uh, in some uh, area under the curve is important. Uh, examples like vancomycin and the time above the MIC would be useful in certain antibiotics like uh, the beta lactam. So you have to use that knowledge to give the antimicrobials correctly uh, with uh, appropriately. I think the next talk will be about that. So principles in antibiotic treatment is only bacterial infections should be treated with antibiotics. So diagnostic stewardship is important. Investigations, including cultures, should be performed on time, that is before starting antibiotics. Correct doses, uh, large doses better than small doses because you have to give the appropriate doses. It should not be toxic, but it should be large enough to kill the mutants. And the correct duration is important, but if it is not a bacterial infection, you can always stop antibiotics. But otherwise, the duration will depend on the infection and the organism uh, so that you have to refer guidelines again. So important things to follow when you're prescribing antimicrobials are to document the indication, whether it's for prophylaxis you're giving or for the treatment, because then you will anybody will know how long to give uh, based on the indication. And then dosage, frequency, and the duration of therapy should be documented. And appropriate investigation should be collected, including the cultures and other microbiology investigations. And the guidelines should be followed. It could be local guidelines of the hospital, the national guidelines, or the international guidelines, if others are not available. And authorization levels should be considered whenever appropriate. I will talk about it later. And then also, it is important to review the patient after 48 hours with the culture results and other investigations to decide whether it's a viral infection. And if so, we can either we can stop the antibiotics or whether we need to de-escalate. That means whether you can come down to a narrow spectrum antibiotic based on the culture results. So levels of authorization, we were discussing this at, uh, in Sri Lanka, we were trying to have this uh, traffic light system where red, orange and green light authorization levels were discussed. But actually at the end, uh, only the red light antimicrobials were issued as a circular by the Ministry of Health. So what are these red light antimicrobials? These are identified as my antimicrobials, which need authorization by the consultant microbiologist of the hospital to prescribe. So that means these should not be given by any other doctor without the authorization of a microbiologist. So this is the list that we have said uh, approved as red light antimicrobials. Here you can see some of them are oral drugs such as fusidic acid, linosolid, moxifloxacin, and levofloxacin. 
which I think are misused very much in the community, which we should stop for good reasons because Levoflux, though it's a simple drug to take, it, it is very useful to treat and uh, maybe sometimes resistant TB. So therefore, this is uh, not to be misused. That is why we have put it as a red light antimicrobial. So how to make sure that the correct doses are given, especially when you're uh, prescribing in the outpatient setting, it is very important that the patient is aware that there is an antibiotic in the list. So inform the patient that this is the antibiotic. And even if you feel well, you need to take this for this duration and you have to take it on time at the correct dose and the that time is important. So that you have to show the patient, tell the patient and inform the patient about it. And also better to look for side effects. So tell the patient that at the beginning, you can tell them that if you develop a severe diarrhea, you can stop and antibiotic can come to me because that they have to inform them. There can be even prostridium difficile diarrhea that can be life threatening. So it is very important to tell them that this, if you develop such a in diarrhea, you better come to us uh, with uh, stop after, uh, I mean, with the antibiotic. Also uh, monitoring for like maybe sometimes it is important to monitor renal functions, uh, liver functions, full blood count and so on, depending on the side effect that we expect from the uh, medicine. And also ask for the specific questions like alteration of bubble habits. And always uh, decide when to convert IV to oral whenever appropriate. Don't just give IV antibiotics for a prolonged period, especially if you have a very good uh, bioavailable antibiotic such as ciprofloxacin, which is like oral is even better than IV most of the time. And source control is very important. If there's an abscess, it should be drained. Otherwise, uh, the antibiotics will not penetrate into the abscess and there will be resistance developing within the abscess. Uh, and then the lines should be removed if it's a line infection and if it's a prosthetic joint infection, the joint should come out. And infection prevention and control is also important. If you're in the hospitals, if healthcare associated infections are the most likely uh, infections which can have antimicrobial resistant organisms, so therefore, if you can prevent healthcare associated infection, it is less likely to get infections with the antimicrobial resistant organisms. And also, if you reduce the infections in the community, you can reduce the need for antimicrobial use. So therefore, you can reduce the development of antimicrobial resistance. And also like practices such as hand hygiene and instrument cleaning will reduce the transmission of organisms which are resistant to antibiotics from one person to the other. So the take home messages are, antibiotics are a precious group of medicines which can save lives if used appropriately. Use of antibiotics will lead to making them ineffective. Therefore, use antibiotics responsibly and when appropriate only. They are effective only for bacterial infections. Do not use antibiotics for viral infections. Use antibiotics only to treat and prevent infections according to guidelines and recommended doses at the correct time interval and for correct duration is important to be adhered to. And source control and infection prevention and control are important to reduce AMR. Stop misuse and save for the future. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh Thank you very much, uh, Kushlani, for that uh, short but uh, excellent presentation and uh, giving an overview on what antimicrobial resistance is and uh, what uh, uh, hazard uh, in today's context. Uh, I think that we will try to answer questions at the end. Uh, uh, that would be more convenient for all. So let me now invite our second speaker. Second speaker is Professor Priyadashini Galapati, Professor of Pharmacology, Faculty of Medicine, University of Colombo. And she would be addressing on adverse outcomes of irrational use of antibiotics. Over to you, Priyadashini. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay, right. Okay, uh, thank you very much, madam. Uh, yes, first of all, let me thank the SLMA for organizing this important symposium. Uh, or the webinar. Uh, okay, right. So uh, my topic is um, 
uh, as informed adverse outcomes of irrational use of uh, antibiotics. So I will try to give some uh, real case histories illustrating ir irrational use of antibiotics and then uh, how antibiotic usage leads to development of resistance, principles of prescribing and evidence-based antibiotic therapy. So what is irrational uh, prescribing? These are all included under irrational antibiotic therapy. Under prescribing, incorrect prescribing, extravagant, uh, that is very expensive prescribing, over prescribing and multiple prescribing. And we see all these uh, happening in our patients. So why uh, the reasons for irrational drug use among people is very often uh, lack of confidence in the diagnosis. If you are not sure what you are uh, you know, treating, then you are likely to uh, give irrational and, uh, uh, medicines. Then uh, inadequate knowledge on evidence-based management. If you do not know the evidence behind, then also you might use drugs ir uh, irrationally. Ease of writing a drug than explaining. Sometimes uh, you know, we just need to give some advice to patients, but it is easier to write something and give. Inadequate examination of the patient, inc incomplete communication, with the uh, patient. And also sometimes if you don't have access to lab resources to make a diagnosis also can lead to ir irrational drug use. Let me uh, uh, you know, give you this case report. This is a case uh, that was reported in, in one of the uh, uh, journals of uh, travel uh, me uh, medicine. A 60 year old British, British uh, tourist presented to the outpatient facility in Kathmandu, Nepal, with a 12 day history of redness, swelling, and blistering of the skin of, of hands and uh, face and hands. Uh, the history is that she was taking thyroxine for hypothyroidism, and before leaving UK, she has commenced uh, mefloquine uh, as a malarial uh, for malaria prophylaxis. Uh, what she said was that 15 days prior to her presentation, she was seen by a doctor in rural uh, northern India complaining of a painful rash on her left upper arm and back consisting of small red blisters. And she had been diagnosed as having shingles, that is her zoster. And this is what she has been prescribed. Acyclovir 200 milligrams, acyclovir cream, cetirizine, nimesulide, which is one of the uh, non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs used in India, and sparfloxazine, um, 200 milligram tablets. So uh, she has uh, antiviral, uh, then uh, antihistamine, uh, uh, NSAID, uh, possibly for pain, and an uh, antibiotic. Three days later, she arrived in Nepal to commence her bird watching, but her hands and feet were getting sunburned despite the sunscreen lo lotions and a, using a hat. <coughs> she visited a Nepalese doctor who diagnosed her as having sun allergy. And that doctor has prescribed cetirizine, uh, dimethidine, another antihistamine, and roxithromycin, another antibiotic. And over the next uh, few days, her skin became skin, uh, still more swollen and uh, blistering was noted. So this is the uh, case report that was the photograph of her. So there are uh, a rash consistent with resolving shingles, her zoster was noted, and a diagnosis of photos, phototoxic skin reaction secondary to sparfloxacin ingestion was made. So this case report highlights some very important uh, principles that we are and problems that we are trying to address. So it, it, it it uh, highlights that the case report demonstrates several points regarding the prevalence and dangers of inappropriate prescribing in South Asia and the difficulties faced by travelers. So here are uh, a few important points. The first doctor consulted in Northern India made an accurate diagnosis of herpes zoster. And despite doing so, he prescribed five different drugs, one, which, one of which was an antibiotic and another an antihistamine. So and for herpes zoster, if it was just clearly blistering, you don't need an antibiotic. The second doctor consulted in Nepal again made a reasonably accurate assessment of the patient, uh, new, uh, patient's new uh, uh, complaint which uh, when he diagnosed sun allergy. So it was a phototoxicity, but just like the first doctor having made an accurate diagnosis, he prescribed three different drugs, including a further course of antibiotic and antihistamines. So therefore this uh, uh, case report highlights the tendency to prescribe inappropriately 
rather than diagnostic ability is the issue uh, highlighted in this case. So therefore, it concludes that travelers to South Asia and those arriving, uh, advising them should be aware of irrational prescribing habits in the region. And, uh, and if this patient came to Sri Lanka, I don't think uh, the, the prescription would have been any different. So polypharmacy, high rates of antimicrobial usage and combination therapies uh, increase the chances of adverse events. And uh, it says the problem is worse, but not confined to the private health uh, sector. So this is uh, in the private sector that has happened in India. Let me now give another case report from, as you are quite aware, the SLMA operates a 247 service. So, which is, uh, you know, uh, uh, a service where doctors give uh, advice to patients during the COVID uh, pandemic. Now over 80,000 patients have been given advice over the phone. So this is one of them. And these cases are discussed in the doctor's forum. A 14 year old girl, previously asymptomatic, um, and she was feeling drowsy after taking medication given by a nurse. Uh, from a prescription issued by a doctor for a rapid antigen test positive COVID-19 infection. So these were the medicines given. Azithromycin, levocetirizine, mefenamic acid, pyroxicum, derifilin, terbutalin, and vitamin C, right? So clearly uh, there's an antibiotic and this uh, girl who was having only uh, two days of symptoms, uh, uh, this antihistamine and two NSAIDs, uh, uh, bronchodilator, two bronchodilators along with vitamin C. So this you can see clearly irrational therapy. Another uh, case report from the SLMA 247 service, uh, another child with COVID-19 prescribed kefixin, another uh, uh, kefalosporin, dexamethasone, prednisolone, and paracetamol. Now, during this uh, COVID-19 uh, uh, pandemic, uh, two most commonly, I would say, abused medicines are antibiotics and uh, steroids. Steroids should not be used during COVID-19 in the early phases because that can make the patient's immunity go down and you can have exacerbation of uh, COVID-19. So it's clearly stated you should not give uh, uh, steroids early uh, for COVID-19 patients only when uh, COVID-19 uh, uh, the cytokine storm sets in, you should give steroids. And antibiotics, again, not recommended. And antibiotics, some people were thinking as it, uh, the um, uh, uh, macrolides like azithromycin have uh, antiviral properties. You don't have uh, you know, proven antiviral properties of uh, these antibiotics, and therefore they are not needed unless the patient goes into COVID pneumonia, in which case you will only you will need. So particularly in the outpatient setting, these patients, vast majority will not need an antibiotic uh, in, during COVID-19. So why bother? Why should we bother about antibiotic misuse? This is one very important factor that I would like to highlight. Antibiotics are the only class of uh, uh, medicines that has an impact on population level, even when prescribed individually. If I take an antibiotic irrationally, it does not affect only me. It will affect others also because the resistance that develops will be transmitted to the others because, and then it can spread globally. That is why this is a global concern because it will affect the global bacterial eco ecology. So antibiotic, uh, antibiotic resistance is one of the most serious global threats to the treatment of infectious diseases. If you look at data on antibiotic use, it is uh, uh, the most widely prescribed therapeutic agent and um, another important factor is nearly 50% of the time prescribing an antibiotic is unnecessary. So most widely therapeutic, uh, prescribed therapeutic uh, group and most 50% of that are unnecessary. And uh, also more than 50%, another problem is uh, 50, more than 50% are purchased privately without a prescription, which happens mostly in, in, in countries like ours. 
and non-prescribed use of uh, uh, antibiotics are used to treat symptoms by 42% of the uh, surveyed population. So that is people keep antibiotics and um, you know, use for others uh, and even uh, for themselves later on. And uh, looking at, I think uh, uh, Dr. Kushilani gave some data. So before 1946, about 90% of staph aureus were susceptible to penicillin, but within less than 10 years, 75% of the isolates were resistant. So therefore with use, resistance development has been confirmed. So this uh, Lancet article showed that countries and hospitals with the fewest control on antibiotic prescribing have the greatest frequency of resistant organisms, which suggests causative uh, relationships. So higher the use of antibiotics, higher the prevalence of resistance. And this is a study from Sri Lanka published this year on antibiotic consumption in our country. So here the conclusion is that private sector disproportionately higher amount of antibiotics are used in the private sector compared to the government sector. If you see, you can see 18% in the uh, consumption of these beta lactamases are in the more in the private uh, uh, public sector, but uh, like um, these, like second generation, third generation uh, cephalosporins and uh, fluoroquinolones, you can see 6% in the public sector, 18% in the private sector. So irrational uh, use in the um, uh, disproportionately higher use of broad spectrum and watch category antibacterials, which uh, Kushlani mentioned, was observed more in the private sector um, uh, according to this. So why should we bother uh, about uh, antimicrobial resistance? Um, another main problem is the number of new antimicrobials released to the market has dropped significantly over the last decade. So no new classes of antibiotics are introduced uh, over the last two decades because companies, you know that medicines are developed by companies, they are investing on drugs for chronic diseases like uh, diabetes, hypertension, heart disease, because once a patient is started on these medicines, they take it almost, uh, uh, you know, uh, for the rest of their life. And therefore, there is more economic benefits for drug companies if they develop medicines for non-communicable diseases. And therefore, no new medicines are coming, no new antimicrobials are coming into the market. And with resistance developing to the existing drugs, infectious diseases could become a serious global threat. And therefore, there is an urgent need to protect our existing antimicrobials. So uh, rational, uh, so, I was talking about irrational use. Then what about rational use? All these are things uh, what is uh, meant by rational use, correct drug for the diagnosis, appropriate indication, appropriate drug considering all this efficacy, safety, uh, there should not be contraindications and correct dispensing. So optimal drug, finding the antimicrobial drug class and the specific member of that class uh, is needed and empiric therapy is necessary in, in uh, most cases. So you have to consider uh, several of these factors, which uh, again, Kushrani also mentioned in selecting antibiotic. You have to give it for the optimum duration. And important thing, my uh, topic is on uh, concerns, um, the, the adverse outcomes. So safety is an important, a very important factor. I don't think people consider a lot of issues about safety. So here, things which we don't uh, consider, uh, even antibiotics like azithromycin, risk of cardiovascular death. If you compare with, uh, for example, um, uh, with penicillins uh, and the risk of de death of cardiovascular risk score uh, much higher for azithromycin compared to, uh, even in red, compared to amoxicillin. Uh, that is because it pr prolongs the QT interval and it has to be used with caution with other drugs causing QT prolongation like non-sedating antihistamines, uh, for example, cetirizine. And clarithromycin and erythromycin inhibit the liver cytochrome drug metabolizing enzymes and it can increase other drugs which are metabolized them like warfarin and theophylline and can cause toxicity, bleeding and um, uh, theophylline toxicity. So therefore, even though we don't think of these, uh, that is an important problem. And also uh, the safety of the newer, anti, uh, uh, newer uh, antimicrobials that are coming in. So people uh, are you know, in a hurry to use the newer ones, but uh, 
until they have been used in wider number of people, we do not know their side effects. So pemafloxacin was withdrawn within a year after introduction. Gripafloxacin was withdrawn two years after introduction. And uh, now I was mentioning about azithromycin uh, causing sudden cardiac deaths. So therefore, when you're selecting antibiotic, it should be the one that satisfies all the other criteria and has the lowest risk of known adverse effects. I must also mention about uh, the allergies uh, to uh, uh, penicillins and uh, uh, the, the beta-lactam plus. There have been patients who have died of um, uh, oral uh, amoxicillin with uh, allergy because uh, sometimes there is no clear history and, and patients have died because uh, the, the when, only when these reports are uh, you know uh, sent for evaluation we realize uh, that th these are happening in the country. Cost effectiveness is an important factor, particularly when you are prescribing uh, these newer um, uh, high, high, high flown antibiotics. So rational use uh, is defined as patient receives medicines appropriate to their clinical needs in doses that meet their own requirement for an adequate time and at the lowest cost to them and their community. So these are the uh, criteria to uh, uh, in selecting a rational uh, in rational use should be evidence based, therapeutic benefit, safety, cost effectiveness, and optimum dose and duration. So evidence based results in choosing an antibiotic, we should consider the evidence. Uh, that is there for uh, this thing. I will just uh, quickly um, give another case study. Uh, a patient going with a runny nose uh, and cough for three days, a prescription given by a GP invariably has uh, an antibiotic and paracetamol and um, here uh, 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 antihistamine. So here the diagnosis is upper respiratory tract infection, etiology is into influenza virus, most likely. So do we need an antibiotic? And if you look at the evidence, meta-analysis of nine randomized controlled trials showed that there is not no evidence of important benefit from treating, uh, of using antibiotics for treat upper respiratory tract infections. So you need only symptomatic uh, uh, treatment, antibiotics are not needed. So uh, I think one reason why doctors prescribe antibiotics is thinking that uh, if you use, um, antibiotic that will prevent a secondary bacterial infection. There's nothing like prophylactic antibiotic use to prevent a secondary bacterial infection. If it happens, you can treat, but not to prevent a, a, a secondary bacterial infection. So antihistamines, is it uh, indicated according to evidence? Yes. Evidence has shown that if you use an antihistamine, that will reduce the symptoms. So therefore, for this patient, you only need uh, paracetamol, two tablets um, given as needed, not uh, given regularly three times a day for five days, which is inappropriate. So you only need paracetamol and an antihistamine. So, so therefore, evidence-based management is giving paracetamol and uh, antihistamine uh, for this patient. So evidence-based medicine is using the evidence um, coming from studies and combining that with clinical expertise and, and uh, also the patient, uh, what the patient needs. So this evidence-based medicine closes the gap between clinical research and our everyday practice. And it needs, uh, it highlights a need for you to read journals, learn what is uh, be, uh, evidence based uh, practice, and use that in your uh, management. So, therefore, uh, in this patient, paracetamol, clofenidamine, uh, or loratadine would be uh, what is really needed and advice on uh, uh, adequate uh, rest. Uh, for the uh, drug, for the uh, virus to be cleared. Uh, by the uh, body's immune system. So in conclusion, antibiotic resistance is inevitable with increased use. It is a major problem worldwide and new antimicrobials uh, released to the market has dropped significantly and therefore appropriate use is the only way of prolonging the life of an antibiotic. Remember, we always uh, uh, teach our students antibiotics are not antipyretics. So don't give antibiotics for any fever because use an antipyretic like paracetamol for that and not an antibiotic. And I would like to end with this uh, Director General of WHO statement at the uh, dawn of the century. He said, now at the dawn of a new millennium, humanity is faced with another crisis 
formerly curable diseases are now arrayed in the increasingly impenetrable in, 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 armor of antimicrobial resistance. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, uh, uh, Priyadashini, uh, for making that presentation very interesting and also informative. Uh, I hope you hear me. The, uh, uh, as you said, the appropriate use of antibiotics is the only way out as at present. So we now know that the use of antibiotics does not affect the individual, but it affects in general all, all, uh, 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 all the uh, humans as well as animals. So that's why we thought that we would address the One Health policy as well. And it is with that, in that context that we thought we would invite uh, Dr. Roshan Priyanta from Veterinary Research Office, uh, Veterinary Research Officer, Bacteriology Division of the Veterinary Research Institute to address antimicrobial resistance challenges in livestock management. So uh, let me invite uh, Dr. Roshan Priyanta to make his presentation on antimicrobial resistance challenges in livestock management. Over to you, Priyanka. Uh, thank you very much, madam. Good evening, everyone. Uh, the, my topic is uh, antimicrobial resistance challenges in uh, livestock management. Uh, yes, uh, so uh, the global demand for animal, uh, uh, animal protein is always increasing because population is increasing because for people who work in animal production so we are really fighting against hunger because people need more food so this is actually the graph from the uh, the fao the global meat estimate you can and also its projections you can see always it's increasing because from uh, from 1961 to if you consider to 2050 the the demand is always increasing and also the livestock productions by the regional wise, this is actually the data from 2007, the most of the animal productions are occurring in the South uh, East and South Asia, especially in China. So that is the most important location if you can consider the livestock production on a regional basis. And also the, uh, if you look at the farming practices, because uh, the all farming practices, uh, uh, this actually two graph photograph from China. So the all farming practices is, is changing, continues changing. Now, because of the land utilizations and animal welfare issues and environment issues, now we have modern farming system. So things has been changing. If you look at the livestock statistics in Sri Lanka, actually we contribute 1% uh, of GDP in, in the country. The, it's a very, uh, if you consider the health sector, it's going to be, a, I mean, it is a really small portion, but the mostly 64% of this total livestock contribution, which represented by the poultry sector, because we have well-developed poultry sector. If we, uh, if anyone goes out uh, if in, in, in any other country, of course, the similar technology are practiced in our poultry sector. So that is why I would say as it's a well-developed poultry sector. And even poultry sector, poultry industry in Sri Lanka, the traditional farming we practiced a couple of decades back. Now the uh, our farming system has been changed. The most of the environmental control houses and fully automated systems are followed. But the total populations of uh, the chicken is around 40 million uh, in, in at the times in in, in in given point. So, so these are the, some of the things, but if you look at the, you know, the, we use antibiotics uh, in livestock. That is the, the main, main, of, main topic in this presentation. If you consider global sales, it's around 93,000 tons in uh, uh, the terms of antibiotics in 2017. It is going to be increased unto more than 100 tons in 2013. The most important thing is that the 70% of these antimicrobials are used by animal industry because maybe livestock or maybe companion animal but the majority of any produce antimicrobials are used by animal industries and the if you consider the enzyme animal health market the antimicrobial market it was like 22 billion usd in 2011 that means a huge market so in the animal health we use 27 different classes of antimicrobials and the other important thing is that 
the mostly these countries, people who work in animal uh, husbandry, they report their uh, quantitative data to the government or regulations or maybe UI. That is reporting is really, really good thing. If we come back to the Sri Lankan situations, uh, we use uh, usually 40 to 80 tons of antimicrobials in livestock sector. So then it's different from animal health, from the human health. We have different perspectives like anti uh, antimicrobials, mainly we use for therapeutic purpose, of course, here yes, treating sick animals. So uh, treating sick animal in individual basis, not quite uh, new techniques in, in veterinary medicine. The mostly uh, in the, uh, especially for example, if I get a poultry example, in one cage, maybe environmental control house, it, can, it consists of maybe 30, 40, thousands number of birds so if you could find any clinical disease or maybe you, you can detect it either by clinical examinations or in the postmodern examination then we found some clinical conditions there that mean infection is going on in the cage then we treat for whole flock that is the that is the standard way of veterinary medicine because there's no point of treating individual animal individual birds so we have to treat for the whole flock that is the one that is the one we we use as metaphylaxis and also prophylaxis because we use preventive treatments for the antibiotics and also growth promoter growth promotion but which is not practiced in sri lanka at the moment but these four methods of using antimicrobials are is globally this is the way that uh, in, in the livestock we use the antibiotic so if you look at the uh, global antimicrobial consumption in livestock you could see uh, you know there are hot spots like china of course the south asia and also europe and North America and South America. These are the, if you look at all over the world, they use antimicrobials in livestock. So this is a really uh, important thing. And also the demand, if you forecast the livestock uh, antimicrobial demand in, in 2013, so also it's increasing, especially you can see the, the special area that is called China. They are going to use more than 50,000 50, uh, tons antimicrobials in 2013. That means the demand is there for the antimicrobials and they use they are going to use antimicrobials for them. And also the uh, if you consider top 10 consumers of veterinary antimicrobials in the world, actually the most leading country is China. The China then followed by Brazil, USA, Thailand, India and some other countries. So because these are the, uh, 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 the Iran and Spain, Russia, Mexico, and Argentina. Actually, those are the countries they use most antimicrobial in livestock sector, or we call it veterinary antimicrobials in the, the leading the top 10 consumers of uh, in, the, in the world. Also, if you look at the uh, situation in Europe, mostly antimicrobial usage uh, in, in, in livestock, uh, in your left hand side, you could see this uh, antimicrobial usage in chicken, uh, sorry, in cow and then in middle chicken and also the swine industry, that means pig industry. So can get an idea about the most of the antimicrobials are used in pig industry in Europe. This is the situation in Europe. Uh, so uh, if you look at that. And if you come back to Sri Lanka, so antimicrobials in livestock Sri Lanka, we have a, I mean, we have a more, uh, four common class of antimicrobials like macrolides, tetracycline, and sulfonamide and penicillin. So those are the, the most common class of antimicrobial we use in our sector, that is in livestock sector. And the, this pattern, this global trend, this is actually a global trend in everywhere in the globally. And also the, you are, the other side is this, this is the situation in Netherlands. These are the most commonly antimicrobial use in Netherlands as well. So that is the, the trend is there, so trend is there here in Sri Lanka as well as in some other countries. And the, also, the, we would like to your attention on that uh, uh, different antimicrobials, commonly used antimicrobials in Sri Lanka uh, for for last five uh, last five years from 2016 to 20, 2020. The penicillin is increasing in trend uh, because uh, and also macrolides, the macrolides is increasing. But in the last year, 2020, there was drastic reductions of antimicrobials and. Also, the sulfonamide is decreasing in trend and also tetracycline, which is also decreasing in trend. And this is to summarize the, uh, all the imported uh, quantities of antimicrobial agents uh, 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 in the uh, 
uh, the animal and veterinary husbandry. You can see that macrolides, penicillins, and sulfonamide cyclines, they were the major antimicrobial to be used in livestock. And the, the, uh, maybe you, if you look at the graph carefully, because in 2016, there were streptogramines and some other, bacteria, other antibiotics were used as, you know, for example, we use virginomycin as growth promoters, but those antimicrobials are discontinued at the moment. So after 2016, then 2017, there were no usage of any virginomycin or streptogramines in livestock sector. And so then the, other, uh, the, the global targets of, uh, of reductions of antimicrobial usage, if you consider that, Basically, the regulation, according to this graph, the regulations, they have a major role. Of course, the reductions of meat is impossible and use of fees is going to be a problem in a country like Sri Lanka. So, of course, regulations, they have a major role. So, it has been described by this publication. I mean, the regulation itself can go up to maybe 60% reductions of antimicrobial usage in livestock. And so Department of Animal Production Health, which is the most, uh, I mean, this is the regulatory body in Sri Lanka, the controlling uh, veterinary antimicrobials. So the, uh, there's no real, no growth promoters allowed by the department at the moment, which was, uh, uh, it was banned in maybe 10 years back. And, but uh, recent, uh, there are some recent decision on that regulating antimicrobial usage in livestock such as the minimum pack size is either one kg or one liter. That is the, the objective is the discouraging the and discouraging the usage of antimicrobials, especially small scale farming communities. Because earlier we could find that maybe 100 ml, 200 ml of bottles and such is, but uh, no more found in the market. And also importers, they have to submit the all the marketing information to the uh, Veterinary Drugs Control Authority before the next consignment. Otherwise, uh, the next consignment will be not released. So, and also this antimicrobial, uh, the, uh, antimicrobial distribution by this report and this uh, report uh, uh, verified by the randomly because uh, maybe through over the, through phones or some other tech, uh, other methodologies, uh, this usage list they are going to be, um, we are going to uh, check it. So, you know, because of that, importers they know that we are going to check it and they are really uh, they are in a position to send in the right information because submitting the wrong information is going to be a problem and also streptomycin cholestine uh, flumiquinine and third generation cephalosporin uh, you know those four antimicrobials has been discontinued by the vdca in addition so and the department they are they have taken an, uh, another new action in last year so I mean, uh, they were getting the information from government VSS, veterinary surgeons, the, their monthly usage of antimicrobials. But it's, it's, it's still in the pilot-based study, probably will be, uh, will be uh, improved in maybe next year. And because we all these uh, activities are going on to reduce the antimicrobial resistance in livestock, of course, because we know that it's a huge problem even in human and also in animal, but ultimately in human. So if you look at the, uh, the, the global picture in antimicrobial resistance in livestock, in, I'm not going to highlight more things, but maybe a couple of slides based on the important things. There is a mobile cholesterol resistant genes with the MCR gene, which is quite common in poultry, commercial poultry. So according to these publications, the cholesterol resistance in poultry, which is everywhere in the world, that means it's not really, really good thing, but we have to be get ready for that, though we have not been reported, but you know, we have to get ready for that. And also the antimicrobial resistance like uh, livestock associated uh, methicillin resistance, uh, Rastaporius, which is quite, uh, quite important. Uh, it's basically, uh, you know, the which is a uh, uh, this is a uh, publication in Korea. So they have identified the methicillin resistance type aureus in livestock, especially in pig farms, not only pig farms from pigs, but also from pig carcasses and also the farmers and some environment sample also. And the other important thing that most of the isolates, they were multi-drug resistant. Some of the isolates were resistant for more than eight class of antimicrobials. So that is, you know, antimicrobial resistance is a, it's a huge problem even in livestock. If you come back to the Sri Lankan situation, so antimicrobial resistance in Sri Lanka and the livestock, uh, yeah, we have to accept that very few publications are found. We don't have much studies in published. 
but the good thing is some of the uh, very good uh, uh, very good uh, the news is actually the real i mean if compared to the rest of the world i mean i'm not going to compare with the rest of the world from sri lanka but methicillin resistance taporias which is quite low in 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 peak in sri lanka uh, which was uh, the uh, publication which was done by kalpahan et al in 2019 and also methicillin resistance taporias which was not found in bovine mastitis in sri lanka so far and also the low level of tetracycline because tetracycline is one of the most commonly used drugs in bovine practice because uh, in cattle in uh, dairy industry we use oxytetracycline and tetracycline but still the resistance is quite low but if you go to the other sides the ctxm ESBL resistance which is uh, in e coli which was 18 percent because of recent publication but importantly the carbonum resistance which is the, the last resort drugs for treating gram negative infection quite low but still the risk is there because it's, it's 0.38 percent in, in according to that study and we haven't reported collagen resistance so far we haven't uh, 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 observed any mcr gene in our livestock but it doesn't mean that it's not there because my think more studies are required so ongoing ongoing studies are really really concerned on that and also quinolone resistance because quinolones, especially enterfloxacin, we use that. So emerging quinolone resistance really alarming in, in poultry industry. This is a couple of publications on that, but uh, the basically the reporting antimicrobials because uh, the people in livestock industry really follow the uh, the OI standards and the OI guidelines and uh, some of the. Uh, big, uh, and most of the reporting antimicrobials is a really important practice in the according to these guidelines because sales data and purchasing information has yeah, also import data so those are the kind of data we are working on at the moment and the uh, as oie uh, oie means uh, i think you all know it's a world health organization so world health animal health organization so probably we are working on four main objectives with oie to uh, to reduce the incidence of antimicrobial resistance. The first thing is improving awareness and understanding, and also strengthen knowledge through surveillance and research, because surveillance is really, really important in livestock sector, in, 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 in especially in animal health, animal health sector. And also support good governance and capacity building and encourage implementations of uh, international standards. Those are the, the uh, main four objectives on antimicrobial resistance declared by OIE as strategies. FA also they have a sort of similar approach, but uh, uh, you know the different wordings, but the almost same outcome and same, same way that they address this problem as a burning issue in, in livestock sector. And also the uh, uh, if you look at the antimicrobial resistant genes and also livestock waste also contribute a lot because this is a recent publication last sorry it's a last year publication in nature they have highlighted that the antimicrobial resistant genes in livestock waste because uh, in these days really we are working on that uh, you know the livestock organic farming and livestock weight as a fertilizer so we really care about that we have to need really more concern about usage of this waste of course uh, uh, you know to minimize the uh, the uh, the risk minimize the risk of antimicrobial resistance even in animal as well as in human and uh, i think dr kushlani explained uh, that because uh, you know sometimes these uh, antimicrobial resistance genes in the animal waste and environments it can be harmful so because of uh, you know we have to be more concerned about using this waste and other uh, environmental contaminants so yeah it's a problem for us in a livestock industry we use a lot of antibiotics but we are working on other alternatives as well because uh, alternative for antimicrobials in livestock is quite important especially our management perspective because we uh, you know the management changes like good management practices there's improving house housing standard in livestock and also improving nutrition and genetics and also breeding so you know different methodologies are being used to uh, 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 use as alternatives because then we try to uh, in, uh, we try to uh, you know to get to minimize the infectious diseases in livestock and also biosecurity because we always try to keep the livestock in a very safe environment like away from infectious agent it's a it's a it's, it's a huge investment for us like in livestock sector but still working on because uh, away from infectious agents is going to be a 
uh, going to be a huge investment return. So that is why uh, the people in livestock sort of sector are really concerned about that other alternatives as well. And also prebiotics and probiotics, we can be used instead of antimicrobials in the livestock and the vaccination is a really common practice. Uh, as I explained to you, the, because uh, our poultry sector is well developed, and so they use a lot of uh, vaccines, like, you know, for the against the viral infections and also bacterial infection. Because of that, and the, the antimicrobial usage uh, has been uh, minimized and reduced because of these old kind of vaccines uh, used in the use in the industry and some of the vaccines actually produced by the, uh, the sri lankan i mean the department of animal production health the government organizations uh, uh, i think uh, we are the only organization that produce vaccine in sri lanka and also some of the huge amount of vaccines are imported from uh, from outside so then the, so if you look at the uh, the future on amr in livestock yeah, it's, uh, as uh, we all concern, all the first speaker and second speaker, so already highlighted that the antibiotic resistance is a huge problem uh, in human and also in uh, an animal. So, so in the what about the future name on livestock? Because we really uh, it's a burning issue. Of course, it's a very costly uh, costly things for our industry because we always we are bound to produce the healthy and safe food, safe food for the human. If you look at the antimicrobial resistance surveillance, because at the moment there's no surveillance system in the animal health sector, so uh, we are actually we need to have one. Then, and also our finding need to be submitted for the AMR focal point. That means uh, the health ministry, Ministry of Health, of course, because then we know what is going on in our 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 surveillance system, and also it's going to be alarming situation for the human health doctors as well. And also national AMR repository, animal health. We are working on that because. Uh, the Fleming Fund under the Fleming Fund program, they have identified as the Veterinary Research Institute as the focal point uh, as a national repository as well, but you know, because of the funding limitation in Indian work. And the our laboratory settings uh, really, uh, and also private sector laboratories, they all they would like to work together because as an industry, we really work with the industry very closely and uh, especially port industry and dairy industry we have very very uh, very close discussion with uh, especially in technical matters we really work together to solve and to combat and get antimicrobial resistance of course because we know that it's a huge problem and the research on amr in livestock sector is quite uh, quite limited and especially because of the limited funding and limited uh, uh, and also molecular epidemiology is a really interesting area in livestock because we're really working on that still we are uh, at the beginning far away we have to go for that so we always try to as a, you know the people in the department of animal production health and industry we always try to give or the, the safe and very nutritious food. So it's actually we are responsible so uh, to minimize the antimicrobial resistance of course in, in you know alt ultimately in animal animal products. So thank you very much for listening to my presentation and also I should thank to uh, Sri Lanka Medical Association giving this opportunity and uh, thank you very much madam for giving us this opportunity. Thank you very much. Yes. Um, thank you very much uh, uh, Roshan, Dr. Roshan Madhulagana for that excellent presentation on antimicrobial resistance challenges in livestock management. I know that that whole uh, uh, description, the detailed uh, presentation is uh, very much new to the medical professionals in, uh, in our practice, but uh, with regard to antimicrobial resistance, this is how the story is. And uh, it is uh, one health policy that we need to be thinking of. And it is a huge, I mean, as it was highlighted by him, AMR is a huge issue for both veterinary aspect uh, uh, as well as for the uh, medical professionals in, the, uh, uh, in our setting. Uh, so it's the time for us to uh, answer a few questions. The, uh, the, I think this question is for Roshan. I think bacterial biofilms uh, I mean, is there a role played by bacterial biofilms in antimicrobial resistance? Uh, yes. Yes. yes, madam, because uh, I think uh, uh, the 
uh, yeah, a bacterial biofilm, of course, you know, it has been scientifically proven. But the, if I relate this question to my sector, like uh, poultry industry, of course, you know, the, in the poultry industry, uh, sometimes, uh, you know, automated drinkers and automated drinking pipelines, we use that. So sometimes because of these pipelines and the biofilms and all the things can be accumulated that's why uh, you know every time the farming day uh, in poultry practice we try to clean it out and every times using a uh, different kind of acidic base and we try to clean try to keep the clean water to the livestock but uh, yeah, yeah biofilm do have a major role because biofilms produce an environment to share in the resistant genes within the such a holistic environment so yes uh, the I mean uh, we, I mean biofilms do a major role in sh sharing uh, resistant genes in, in bacterial species. Right. If I may answer that, um, uh, yes, the, yes, with the human sector, it is very important. Uh, it's a very important point. I think I mentioned about the source control. Uh, that is like if you have a line infection, central line is associated bloodstream infection. The line has to be removed because the biofilm which is there on the on the line is difficult to uh, remove without uh, removing it because antibiotics cannot penetrate enough into the uh, biofilm and therefore the bacteria will survive inside the biofilm and they produce uh, antibiotic resistant bacteria and therefore it is very important that you remove the source the biofilms uh, otherwise the the prosthetic joint infections the central line associated bloodstream infections the removal of the source is important because of these biofilms actually the biofilms play a major role in uh, antibiotic resistance and uh, uh, treatment is a problem thank you for that uh, question uh, thank you very much uh, kushlani uh, the next is uh, even though some bacteria showed the presence of some antibiotic resistance genes it does not always exhibit the inhibition zones phenotypically in abst do you think this kind of results are due to the expression levels of antibiotic resistant genes? Yes, uh, again, yes, uh, because I think you have to understand that there's a, sometimes there's a discrepancy between in vitro and in vivo uh, effect of the antibiotic resistance. There are so many reasons for that. Uh, one reason is, uh, yes, uh, there is a thing called inducible resistance. Though the genetic material for the resistance is there in the bacterium, it may not be always manifested. So it may not be shown in the in vitro uh, plate where you do the antibiotic sensitivity testing. But later, when the people are given this antibiotic, particular antibiotic, which they initially were sensitive to in the ABSD, they may develop the resistance in the body. So that, that is called inducible resistance. So that is one reason. So there are many other reasons like uh, where the in vitro and in vivo uh, resistance is not always uh, matching. So there are many reasons like uh, if you look at the guidelines now, we, we, we interpret our resistance, uh, antibiotic resistance based on certain guidelines like international guidelines. Uh, one such guideline is a CLSI guideline which we follow. Uh, and that also is amended every year based on this evidence, what we see, because in vivo, uh, they are trying to match this uh, in vivo, in vitro balance, you know, like the balance, the difference. But uh, there is always uh, differences in the, in, the, in the interpretation. So that problem is always there for many reasons. So one is this inducible resistance. And there are other reasons as well, uh, where maybe the pharmacokinetics, pharmacodynamics, all this can affect the effect in the body which may not be shown on the plate. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Kuslani. And this would be, I think we'll make this the last question because that we are pressed for time. There are some virulence mechanisms of microbe, microbes such as uh, quorum sensing, which is leading to virulence in many bacteria. There are some inhibitors to inhibit such virulence mechanisms in bacteria, is there any possibility to focus on such alternatives in controlling their virulence? Yeah, I mean, forum that, that we have still not, I mean, we have, we have not overcome this forum sensing is there in bacteria, but I think it's, uh, it's not uh, still possible to get, uh, I think we don't have anything to, I mean, overcome it yet. Uh, but I think there was another question on something similar about the other options other than antibiotics. 
So that is also possible. Now we use like one thing that we are doing with the with the resistance is something that we are using. Uh, we have to move away from antibiotic use and we have to go for other options such as probiotics, like what uh, uh, this uh, about the veterinary sector, what Roshan was mentioning. So that something similar, even in even in a uh, human sector, we have to use other options sometimes. Uh, like we do fecal transplant because sometimes bacteria or even phages can be used to treat bacterial infections. So that is some other options that we have to now look for. So I'm not sure whether we have got anything to do with quorum sensing at the moment, but uh, we have other options uh, other than the antibiotic to treat uh, bacterial infections, which we have to uh, think about. Thank you. I think that uh, we had a very fruitful webinar and uh, we were able to discuss on every aspect of the uh, antimicrobial resistance, particularly uh, this value, the significance of it in our clinical practice for both human as well as the uh, in veterinary sector. And it was possible for us to highlight how and why it becomes a nationally important issue for us to think twice before we uh, prescribe antibiotics for our Day to, in our day-to-day -day clinical practice. So we line up three eminent speakers, Dr. Kushlani Jaitileka, who talked to us on the, I'm sorry, uh, post-antibiotic era, are we heading towards? And then Professor Predashini Galapati address adverse outcomes of irrational use of antibiotics. And Dr. Roshan Priyanta, on antimicrobial resistance challenges in livestock and management. So I think that I'm very thankful to all these three speakers for their excellent contribution on this webinar on antimicrobial resistance. And uh, let me thank all other doctors who join online for this SLMA organized webinar. So let us conclude. Uh, thank you very much for joining and uh, let me say good night and stay safe. Thank you.